Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided, this threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy is sponsored by Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with the intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Products include Westlaw, Practical Law, and Firm Central legal practice management software for small law firms. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the Greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is Life Illuminated. And Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan, acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. A Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. And welcome back to Access to Democracy. Uh, great synchronization between Mary in the control room and the interviewer. As her arm went down, we started speaking. Incredible. And we've only been doing this 18 years. <laughs> Happy to have with us Steve Hunnigs. Uh, Steve has been with us many times before. Couldn't be here at a more opportune time because as the executive director of the, uh, really, Minnesota and the Dakotas uh, Jewish Community Relations Council, uh, so much has been happening. And he found his way here to the studio today. Uh, we, we'll Without never incident. Let, we'll mm. never let him forget the fact that he's been on many programs <laughs> over the years and got lost last time in. But I get lost going home from the studio to my house, so, uh, which is four miles away. So it happens. Anyway, Steve, welcome back. Thanks, Alan. And it's always great to be here. You have one of the great public affairs shows in our community and you have wonderful people that work with you. And of course, Sharon is always the highlight. So it's great to be here. Thank you. They are the talent. I'm just the pretty face in front of the camera. And it's yeah. a very pretty face. And too. without them, I could do nothing. Exactly. With them, I don't do so much. <laughs> but <laughs> be that as it may. You couldn't be here, as I said, at a more opportune time after we just had the insanity of a shooting before a congressional baseball practice and one congressman who's in very serious condition, four people shot, uh, just emblematic of the insanity that seems to be permeating uh, the consciousness of this country at the present time. And talking about prejudice, you live with it. Your organization deals with it, whether it's anti-Semitism or whether it's anti-Muslim. And I know you've had some great inroads with the Muslim community. Uh, where are we going? What's happening here? It might be a little bit incongruous considering what you just described, the shooting of Representative Scalise. Focus on the positive for a moment, though. After the bomb threats, the JCC bomb threats in St. Paul and Minneapolis, our community, Jewish community, really on behalf of all of us, received a letter, 227 members of the clergy, Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, Buddhist, all expressing support and affirming their solidarity with the Jewish community. That's big, that's important. That is important. A few weeks later, after the St. Paul incident, the St. Paul bomb threat, 
an ad appeared in the Star Tribune, half-page ad signed by leaders in the Muslim community and their institutions, mosques, schools, social service agencies, expressing solidarity, affirming their support for the Jewish community. The point here is never to be forgotten. People of goodwill, people of good faith, people who want to improve and contribute to our Minnesota far outnumber, far outnumber the people who are marginal and want to cause trouble. Nevertheless, not only in Minnesota, but I think you can say that oh, sure. throughout the Absolutely. country. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the case. There was uh, a bombing someplace where uh, I don't remember if it was a Jewish community where a Muslim mosque offered them uh, the use of the facility or vice versa. It was vice versa down in Texas. <clears throat> yeah. I think it was Texas. I might be getting the fact I wrong. Think, yeah. The small community, small Jewish community, synagogue, the mosque was attacked, vandalized, burned, and the leaders of the congregation either went over to the leader of the local Muslim community or they came over, whatever the case was, and they just handed the person the key and said, it's all yours to use as you see fit and as you need. These are the stories that we need to emphasize. That said, we can't uh, gloss over a serious incivility in this country. It'd be the rhetoric has ramped up. Yeah, uh, starting at the top, unfortunately, <clears throat> as far as I am concerned, I, I think that uh, Trump during the campaign, who sort of justified or encouraged violence, and people just lose themselves. People who are not that well informed, people who wouldn't ordinarily do that. Uh, and I think the rhetoric on the left is what drove this guy to take a rifle to a baseball practice the other day. Uh, it, it is frightening, but words do have consequences. And it's up to our leaders to tamp it down not to be so partisan that you can't talk to the other side and try to bring some stability and common sense to this uh, world. <clears throat> incivility or addressing incivility is a communal problem. And it's not only our elected officials, by the way. And a responsibility, we all have a responsibility. And the Talmud teaches one of my favorite dicta of the Talmud is, it's not our responsibility to perfect the world, but we can't desist from the effort. So in other words, we all have to model civility ourselves. Not always easy, by the way, but we it's also have to model easy at times. civilities. Absolutely. So we have to start <clears throat> there, and we should hold our elected officials responsible too, but we all have to do our part. In democracy, right? Your show is called Access to Democracy. Democracy depends on people treating each other with respect. It doesn't mean there can't be hard-fought arguments. It doesn't mean there argue. can't be sharp differences of opinion. We but at the end of the day... We can argue on philosophy. We yeah. can argue on things like that. <clears throat> but we can't then go berserk if we don't get our own way or even stop people from getting their own way uh, by initiating things prior to an event. I mean, what's the underlying assumption of either the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution? Consent of the governed. And consent of the governor lies, replies upon sort of a consensual agreement between all of us that at the end of the day we're going we're to abide by the jury results, we're going to abide by the election results, we're going to abide by what the legislatures decide, and we're going to treat each other decently. And hopefully that there's going to be motivation for compromise too because so often our arguments are not between right and wrong, between different shades of right or different shades of not so right. What makes this country great is the ability to unleash the great talents of people because we can find ways to get along. And we're unfortunately seeing the same conduct worldwide in many respects. Uh, attacks on minorities. At the moment, it's Muslims. Uh, it's always been Jews. Uh, but other minority groups as well. <clears throat> and I don't think these attacks are necessarily coming from the majority. I think they're coming from some unhinged people uh, who just can't deal with whatever it is uh, that they're against. Let's start with this baseline assumption that all of the world's great religions teach virtue, right? 
And for what, whatever religion it is that we follow, we should be plumbing those virtues in order to model our lives. Or if you're a person of no faith, you obviously people are raised respecting each other, respecting values and the like. But you're right. Let's take one example. The cops in Egypt. I went and visited St. Mary's Church after the first attack recently, uh, two or three months ago, and it extended my condolences. I went and learned a little bit about, the, we have a local Coptic community, wonderful people, professionals, many of them. The Copt priest is actually a former urologist from Egypt. Uh, they have huge emphasis on education. So often their religious leaders are people who have a professional degree in medicine or law or whatever the case We're may be. We're talking about Coptics, not Cop Cops. COPT, yeah. Co the Cop community. Important for all of us, it's a small, relatively small congregation in South St. Paul, it's called St. Mary's. Well, let's go learn about the, Cop the Coptic community that we have in the Twin Cities. Going to an iftar tomorrow night, you know, people may not appreciate the fact that amongst the woes, well beyond that, in the Horn of Africa, yet another famine has descended upon that part of the world. And another thing we need to learn about is how that's impacting the Horn of Africa. In our community, as we all well know, we have large diaspora communities, Somali. Famine, drought, disease. Yeah. Lack so, of education. So this is Ramadan, and by the way, what do we say at Ramadan? Ramadan Mubarak, a blessed, joyous Ramadan to people. And we're going, my family, tomorrow night to this iftar. Iftar is the, is the meal after the breaking of the daily fast for Ramadan. But we want to hear an organization that's based in the Twin Cities called Arava, if I'm getting the acronym right, which is a nonprofit that works in the Horn of Africa helping people distressed because of the famine. Huge way to address incivility or worse is getting to know the people. It's basic axiomatic sociology that it's much more difficult to dislike people when you work with them or know them. And we have an opportunity in this country where we have so many people who have come to this country to get to know folks. So even though you've been here many times, tell us the functions and the aim of the Jewish Community Relations Council. <clears throat> you know, sometimes I like to go back to our foundations, to our bedrock, to Leviticus. And what does Leviticus say 36 times? The most, the most, the instruction recited the most in the Bible, in the Torah, it says, treat your neighbor as they sell for you were a slave in the land of Egypt, right? And if there's anything that we can bring to the world, it's that teaching of two or 3,000 years, which of course was adopted whole cloth in the Gospels, too. It's great symmetry between Jews and Christians along that point. Whenever we're doing things, the JCRC, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, are we contributing positively to the community? Are we helping others? Are we reaching out to others? <clears throat> That's a thread that runs through what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And you've just completed 10 years and we're honored for everything that you have accomplished during that period. I'll amend that a little bit. It should be for what our entire community does together, Jewish and greater. We have a fabulous staff at the JCRC. Added up, we have something like 120 years collectively together. I happen to be the person who bears the title of executive director. The Been buck there stops years. there, however. So, But we're the <laughs> recipient of an outstanding staff and generous supporters and a wonderful board and a great president and then people like yourself who allow us to come on your fine show and speak about the issues. So thank you, Alan. No, thank you. Thank you. I have for something for you. Can I give you something? Well, I don't know. It depends. Well, just, were you know. You, were you frisked <laughs> before you? Uh... You asked about missions of the JCRC, one yeah. of which is Holocaust education. One, because it's important to learn and remember the lessons of the Shoah. But two, because we want to apply those lessons to prevent the genocides of today. This is 25th anniversary issue of a book that was a quarter century ago published by the JCRC, which we've updated and uh, edited and the like, called Witnesses of the Holocaust. These are the stories of Holocaust survivors who came to Minnesota and the lives they made, and of liberators, Minnesota soldiers who participated in the liberation of the camps. So it's our book, and I wrote a preface for it, so I finally had the opportunity in life to actually autograph people somewhat legitimately, because I wrote two or three pages. For the book, what I says to, to you, Alan, dear Alan, thank you for being a great journalist and public affairs host and, and commentator. Your friend, and your friendship, thank you for your friendship and your graciousness 
in inviting my participation many times and access to democracy over the years, which allows us an important media platform for discussing the various missions of the JCRC. And so, well, thank you so th much. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> didn't talk about all the times we talked about baseball and the Twins and the like, but that can be for another show. I, I, I will certainly cherish this. It's interesting because uh, recently we had Alejandro Bear oh, Alejandro, on, terrific on the show again, and uh, from the Feinstein Center at the U. And uh, one of the things we talked about, one of the great experiences I had was teaching my Holocaust and genocide class at Inver Hills for six years. Unfortunately, it went away, budgets and a lot of other things. <clears throat> And I have accumulated a large library of uh, Holocaust and genocide uh, books and things like that, which I'm donating to the U. Outstanding. Uh, but not this. <laughs> Alejandro, you, you should know, I'm very proud of him, A, because he's a friend, B, he does great work at the university. But C, I was on the search committee that uh, selected Alejandro. As in fact, I was the only non-faculty member of the university that was part of the committee. And it's just not Alejandro. It's Dan Wilderson at St. Cloud State University. It's Rebecca Hightower Weaver at University of North Dakota. As you say, Inver Hills over the years, Bethel. What we're doing is bit by bit by bit creating something of a regional university level Holocaust educational opportunities for people throughout the upper Midwest. And Alejandro and Dan Wilderson, the people I just mentioned, are all at the heart of it. And that's really uh, one important facet of our history uh, that we can't let go of. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as we are moving education uh, with the emphasis on STEM, uh, which is very important, with the emphasis on uh, technical advances, which is very important, sure. we are losing, as I just mentioned recently uh, in another interview, we're losing the emphasis on the humanities and the social sciences, and they are equally important. And because we are not emphasizing them, because we're not educating in that regard, I think you can attribute a lot of the uptick in violence to people who wouldn't be so persuaded had they had the education and the knowledge which we're no longer furnishing to them. True enough, and there's always within higher education demand. You know, we're providing much of resources to show us the return on this investment. What's reassuring is you know, we have particularly close relations with Augsburg and Concordia and their presidents who are wonderful people and their commitment to the liberal arts education. And we have to emphasize, where did we start this discussion today, Alan? And that's, you know, people can't talk to each other. People don't know the facts. People are sometimes enmeshed in their own emotion. What does a classic liberal arts education do for you? Well, one of the features of it is the ability to think, analyze, learn to have differences of opinion in a civil way with your classmates when you go to college or graduate school. And to present history so that you can understand yeah. the, the lunacy of some acts in the past uh, that we unfortunately keep repeating. You said something about <clears throat> Holocaust, for instance, uh, not wanting to lose sort of our grip on the history. One thing I always tell people, Salo Baron, who was a great Jewish historian, in fact, he was the first witness in the Eichmann trial story for a different time. He had the first chair of Jewish history in the United States at Columbia. He always said, avoid the temptation to take the lac lacrimose view of Jewish history. That is, that we're s somehow Jewish history is nothing more than a summary of massacres and d uh, disputations and deportations culminating in the Holocaust. I mean, nothing could be more false than that. I mean, we study these things for the benefit of the entire mankind so we can understand why they occur. But Jewish history, like history of all civilizations, is full of glories and literature and learning, and fantastic stories and heroism and the like. So just let's always remember that for every people, that the temptation, of course, is to dwell on the difficult, but when there's so much wonder in all traditions and civilizations to observe over time. Uh, you recently featured something about uh, Father Patrick Du Bois. Mm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about this priest sure. and his continuing search. And search for truth. I mean, going, back, yeah, truth, going yet yes. again to your 
first point today, humanities. What is humanities after all the liberal arts education? Is a search for the truth, or at least a search for understanding. Oftentimes, you can't always discern the truth, but you can always discern the process to try to reach the truth in any event. Uh, Father Dubois, a French priest, has committed his life overarching to better understanding between Catholics and Jews, very much consistent with the teachings of the Nostra Aetate, something that we've emphasized <coughs> over these last couple years. He wanted to give life to the people lost in the Holocaust. And he appreciated the fact that in the killing fields of Eastern Poland, former Soviet Union, Lithuania, White Russia, Ukraine, uh, the Germans and their native collaborators, unfortunately, machine gun people where they found them. Oftentimes, not out in the forest, but in the center of villages. No graves, no memorials. As awful as it is, when you go to Auschwitz, there is an Auschwitz. There is a Treblinka. The Germans kept meticulous records. But for these million or more souls that were lost, including many, many thousands of children, My understanding nothing. from my parents is that we lost relatives at Bobby Yar. Yeah. So I don't know that to be a fact. I, you know, yeah, but Ashenko's famous, famous poem about yeah. what happened at yeah. Bob, Bobby Yar. But he has gone with his volunteers throughout this vast geographical reach to do two things. One, to find and identify where the graves are, and two, to connect with the people that lived in the villages. Because he, he's a priest, he wears a collar. Many times, and these people were not accomplices, sometimes they were bystanders, but they were not accomplices. They have their own expiation necessary in life. And so he approaches them like a priest. He is a priest, mm -hmm. he talks to them. Oftentimes they reveal things. It happened here, it happened there. They talk about things that they've suppressed for years. There's a human side, and then there's, of course, history. And in a way, he's, to those who were murdered anonymously in that sense, he's bringing them back their lives, or at least their identities. And what he's doing is so important because as time passes, and it's 70 plus years already since the end of the Holocaust, uh, <clears throat> or the Holocaust as we know it anyway, there are small holocausts going on around the world even as we speak. But he at least is trying to touch people who have a, a memory and a recollection before that is lost. Much the same as uh, several organizations both here and in Israel are trying to really... They call their organization Yachad Unionum, that's not quite it, but the Hebrew word for one, the Latin word for one. Laura Zell of our staff, like all of our staff, who does a marvelous job, said he's available, he's coming, shall we do it? And I said, you make the call. You know, it's not an insubstantial investment, but for all the right reasons. We brought together the Basilica, the Archdiocese, Catholic Foundation, and because Laura, we, wanted people to, we wanted people to share in the moment and the education. Laura, who you just mentioned, uh, made a documentary film, if I'm not mistaken, about the Greek community, uh, the Jewish Greek community that was wiped out, that is something that people don't necessarily even know. There are Jewish Greeks? Well, uh, yes, there were. It was her family. Yes. Her uh, gr great auntie yeah. and grandma, uh, great auntie and, pardon me, aunt and mom and grandparents, saved by a righteous Gentile in Greece. Her family probably traces its roots back to the Romanisti people that were Jews that ended up in Greece after the destruction of the Second Temple. And she was farsighted enough when she was growing up, had an uncle who was particularly colorful, uh, to record his recollections, and that became the, the basis for the Shadows of the Acropolis. We made and five was, movies and then that led to... I uh, was privileged to be at the premiere yeah, of, that, you're right. of that movie. And, and uh, that led to Transfer of Memory, our exhibit about survivors of the Holocaust, which has been throughout the Upper Midwest with tens of thousands of people have seen. And again, the emphasis is telling the stories, but we want to learn the lessons so we can reach out and try to prevent the genocides of today and tomorrow. Right? And unfortunately, uh, we have a lot of lessons as a society yet to learn. <clears throat> it's starting, true. you know, right here at home. And, and what we have to do is tamp down the rhetoric and somehow or other get people. And as unfortunate as the shooting the day before yesterday was, uh, there are indications that it did have an effect on members of the House of Representatives. <clears throat> it remains to be seen 
how long that will last. I am hopeful that maybe it will be significant, but that's down the road. That's to talk about in your next interview. Local Connection, Representative Scalise, his roommate is Representative Paulson. Yeah. We, who's always a very s sober individual to begin with. He's not part of the, the bomb-throwing class of the House of Representatives, but Eric's a good friend, and I was fortunate. Again, it's really more of an, a reflection of the staff than for me that at this uh, ten, at our annual event when they talked about my 10 years at the JCRC, they had videotapes from Senators Franken and Klobuchar and from Paulson. It's not the point to talk about who it was that spoke, but bipartisan. We're a bipartisan organization. Really critical to remember that. And our country works best when we work on a bipartisan basis. And th there's no question about that. I mean, uh, you, you, you're proven, growing up, you remember a time when Democrats and Republicans talked. They may have debated, they may have argued, they may have argued in spirit and with great spirit, but ultimately they well, found ways to get story. along. Maybe it's uh, the story that I've told to you before, but uh, in the limited time we have left, when my twin sons were bar mitzvahed, uh, I happened to be at that time a Democratic leader uh, of an assembly district on Long Island. <clears throat> In attendance was the Republican leader who went on to become a Supreme Court judge and uh, several local representatives who were Republicans, as most of Long Island was at that time. And we communicated. We differed philosophically, but we communicated. And the sadness is that I see that that has dissipated to such a degree. Look at the 1965 Voting Rights Act, <clears throat> okay? It's remarkable that in Minnesota, we still have a number of members of our congressional delegations to live. Walter Mondale, Al Qui, uh, Don Frazier, and Alec, uh, Alec Olson, pardon me, Democrats, Republicans. Our delegation, like many of the delegations outside the South, but it still bears repeating, all voted in favor of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, as they and did for the Civil Rights Act of 64. That may be a good place for us to wind up because, believe it or not, our time. How does that has happen so down. quickly? I don't know. I, I think that Mary plays with the clock in there. <laughs> and uh, when we think it's 30 minutes, it's really less than 30 minutes. But we've been talking uh, again, and we will hopefully in the future, with Steve Hunnigs of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas. And uh, it's always an education, always a pleasure. Uh, you've got a half minute to impart any thoughts, and I want to thank you very much for my gift. You're welcome. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I'm following this for fi filming purposes, Mike Cerisi, and we could all go into this whole long conversation about Mike and the practice of law and Jewish lawyers and how Jewish lawyers organized themselves in the 30s, and that's a reflection of the culture of the, the time and my family connection to Mike, and it sort of all comes full circle when you have this very different and interesting guests, and I walk in and I see I Mike Cerisi. Thank again. you.